go. What's up? Let's go. We're at church. We're at church today. In our Spring into Summer series, last week Alex did a great job. Spring into Bloom, right? Today I'm going to talk about Spring into Action. And, uh, you know, listen, it's all about getting to heaven, right? That's what we all, hopefully that's why we're here. We want to get to heaven. We want to make it. So it reminds me of a story of two friends, George and Danny. You know, the time came for Danny to pass, and he got to the pearly pearly gates, and, you know, the angels were there, and they got the book out, and he's like, I'm Macaluso, I'm here, I'm ready to be home, and they're like, okay, great, they're looking at the book, they're like, Macaluso, no Macaluso, I was like, what, come on, man, really, like, I really tried hard, I was like, well, you know what, wait, there's one other book, let me check, so they get this other book, you know, and they bring it out, and he's looking through to like, Macaluso, you just made it. They had a book of you just made it? We just made it. I go, okay, well, hey, as long as I get in, I I don't care. That's good. They go, yeah, but there's a caveat. When you just make it, you have to be chained to a a smelly, kind of ugly creature for the first thousand years in heaven. I'm like, ah. All right, man, you know, a thousand years is like a day, a day is like a thousand years, so okay, I'll do it. I'm in though, right? Yeah, you're in. You just got to have the ugly, smelly creature. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So Danny's up there for a little while, and all of a sudden he looks, and he sees George up there walking around. But he's strapped to a beautiful supermodel. (laughs) Danny has a little issue with this, goes to the angel and says, oh, we need to talk. Like, you know, I know I wasn't the greatest Christian, but I was as good as George, like... (laughs) Why do I get the creature, and he gets the beautiful supermodel? And the angel goes, no, no, Danny, you don't understand. That beautiful supermodel, she just made it. (laughs) Three, two, one. Some of you guys just got it, right? It's really good when you get it, so. It's all about making it to heaven, right? Okay, listen, today's Cinco de Mayo, right? How many of you guys know what that is about? what it is and why it's oh my gosh wow that's crazy one person because i told you what the sermon was (laughs) okay may 5th 1862 what happened was the mexicans were trying to fight against the french army and so to keep their freedom and so there was a small group of mexicans that were way outnumbered by the powerful french army of napoleon But these guys fought with conviction and purpose, and they won the battle. They fought for their freedom, they had conviction on it, and they won that battle. That small group defeated this monstrous, awesome army because they had conviction and purpose. That's what Cinco de Mayo celebrates. Man, that's a good fact you know for the rest of your life now, right? But I was just thinking, for us as Christians, what do we live for? What do we live with conviction about? What do we have purpose about? You know, like I said, last week, Alex did this great lesson about building powerful roots and really being strong in God so that you could then bloom and bear fruit. And I was thinking about, well, what ways did Jesus want us to bear fruit? What does he want us to do with our lives? And that's why I say spring into action, because that's what God needs us to do as Christians, to spring into action. So I want to just walk through a few scriptures looking at what Jesus did with his life. And what was important to him while he was here. So this is the first call to action that Jesus gives, Matthew chapter 4. Now, just to give you a little background, he's been going around, he's been doing miracles, he's been teaching for a little bit. The apostles had seen him in Luke chapter 5. If you read the story where he tells them, throw the net on the other side of the boat, and they get this monstrous catch of fish. So they they know who he is. They get it, right? And so in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18... This is when he gives them the first call to action. In verse 18, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing the nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Immediately, they did it. This is when he gave them the call. He gave them a new purpose in life. 
They were fishing for fish. He said, your new purpose is you're going to fish for men. You're going to be a soul saver and eternity changer. I'm giving you a new purpose in life. And they followed him immediately. Why? Because they knew him. You see, when you really know Jesus, when you get it, when you know who he really is, there's no hesitation. When the master calls you, this amazing, miracle-working man, when he calls, you go when you know him. Some of you guys, you hesitate. Some of you guys struggle. It's because you've got to focus on getting to know Jesus. When you know who he really is, there's no hesitation. You go because there's no one like him. Guys, he's saying spring into action. We're going to fish for men. Amen. Giving them this purpose. Purpose is what I really believe so many of us strive for in our lives. Yeah. We're looking for it for most of our lives. I mean, the devil is trying to trick us. He wants us to be about our house and our car and our money and our status and our popularity. That's all going to burn, folks. It's all going to burn. It will mean nothing. Your house will mean nothing. Your car will mean nothing. None of that means anything. How popular we are on earth means nothing when you face God. It's all about your relationship with Jesus. That's what you need to invest in. That's what's important. You know, I've seen these bumper stickers over the year, right? Whoever dies with the most toys wins. Life sucks and then you die. I mean, that's, that's not a way to live. God has so much more for us. Today I ask you, what is your purpose in life? What do you truly live for? If someone looked at your calendar, what you do with your time, what would they see as your purpose? The most important thing. What is your purpose? And I'll ask you this question. What will your purpose matter in 100 years? What will it matter? Will it get you in those pearly gates? What will it really matter? That's, that's how we get deceived by the devil, to think this stuff is important. It's just not. We're here for an instant. And it doesn't matter how much money you have or how you dress like popular, nothing. It won't matter when you stand before God. He's going to be like, how's our relationship? That's what matters. And so he gives us this amazing purpose. I mean, we, we get to build an eternal legacy. When we, are, when we make our life about reaching others for God, you're literally say, helping save souls. You're literally changing the eternal destiny of people with your life. It's what we get to be a part of. It's not a hassle. It's my favorite thing. I always wanted purpose. And God gave it to us to be fishers of men and women, to be out there making a difference. He calls us ambassadors for Christ. And we get to be ambassadors. We are representatives of heaven. That's better than the job you work now. That's better than your hobby. You represent the almighty God. Come on now. That's pretty awesome stuff. That's the reason to wake up in the morning. And you just look at Jesus' life. So here's the first thing he calls them to. And then you just go through and you look at different scriptures. Luke 19, 10. Jesus says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. It's why he came. In Ephesians 2, verse 10. It says, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to get a lot of stuff and drive nice cars. Oh, no, sorry. That's the compromised version of the Bible. <laughs> created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Mark chapter 1, verse 38. He said to them, let's go to the neighboring villages so I may preach there too. This is why I have come. This is why he came. He came to make a difference eternally for people. To show them his life. To show them his love through dying on the cross. It's what he came for. And you know, as Christians, we're supposed to imitate Jesus. What does that mean for us? What should that look like in your life? Well, I think it's, it says what it should mean. When he asked them to be fishers of men, listen, number one, this is a need. Folks, look at the news. The world needs Jesus because it ain't working. Our college campuses are a mess right now fighting over people that are trying to destroy each other. And the only person that's winning is the devil when humans kill each other. When humans are racist, when humans are selfish, he's the only winner. But we get so into, oh, yeah, but it's about my thing and my thing. That's devil talk, man. 
That's not what God wants. This, it's a need for us to be fisher of men. It's a need for Christians to act like Jesus. It's a need for us to get out there. It's also a command. God commands us to do it. It's a plea on his behalf. Please help me find people and save them. It's a mission, but it's an honor and a privilege. We are called to spring into action. To do that, that's what he entrusts us with. That's what's so amazing. You know, with our church, I just, it was so cool. Dan was just doing the announcements. He was just going through the different groups in our church. And I mean, I just get so inspired to see that every age, every group can have purpose. You know, our 412 group, I, I know that Alex and Lydia and Liana, Luke and Michael, they, man, they just have a vision to help their campus know God, to help their friends know God, to help young people come to faith. They live with purpose, and they have a blast doing it. It doesn't have to be miserable. Like, oh, i got to share my faith. Uh, I'll go to hell if I don't. Uh, I'm, people are going to think I'm a Jesus freak. What are people going to think? Well, you want to know what they think. That's the point. And so, man, they're having a blast, though. I mean, come on. What other ministry is making candy salads? Come on. Man. Like, yeah, that's just torturous to be a part of, making candy salads. I'm like, it's pretty impressive. You know, our Thrive group, Thrive in the house. Woo! Thrive. They're, man, these guys are on fire. Our young professionals, post-college ministry. They're, man, they're always out doing stuff, playing in football leagues, basketball leagues. They've been playing in a pickleball league. Yeah, right? It's awesome. It's like, and now we're entering into the realm of kickball. I had to finagle my way to be the coach. It's, it's not going to be around it, right? It's, you know, I had to retire from football. Yesterday, I posted the kickball stuff on my Facebook, and my one friend played football with me goes, you quit football to play kickball? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not playing football. I'm not playing kickball. I'm just coaching. But you see, everything we do is to reach people. Yeah. Man, all the kids in the building blocks, they're all playing these baseball leagues, and their parents are out there sharing their faith, trying to let people know. And you could have a blast as a Christian and still be righteous and make a difference in the world. Yeah. I mean, we all just about died at the silent disco the other night. <laughs> my, my knees felt my age. I'm like, like whoo. Uh, Horizons, they're never done. They do the largest lunch and dinner group parties you ever see. Everywhere they go. Spencer is still out there going to open mics, doing their I mean, it's like every part of our church is trying to be involved with their purpose. To make a difference in their life. That's, that's what it's all about. The first thing he called them to was to spring into action and be fishers of men. Well, let's look at now, after he called them, let's look at what else he did here. A second call to action, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. So now he called those guys. He's moved along a little further. And he, now he's got the 12 with him, you know, his, his apostles. It says, Jesus continued going around all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. Because they were distressed and dejected, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of harvest and send out workers into his harvest field. He's like, he's got compassion on the people. And they were distressed and discouraged. Now listen, I'm going to guess that they weren't like walking around going, oh, I'm discouraged and depressed. I'm guessing they were just like any regular crowd of people we see today. But what do we see? Do we see the spiritual emptiness? Do we see their need for eternal redemption? Or are we just looking at their clothes and their car and thinking, oh, they don't need God. Everybody needs God. Everybody. We all need a Savior. Can't look at the outward. Jesus looked at the heart, and he had compassion on them. That's what he had, and it, and, and it drove him to say, guys, the harvest is abundant. There's a lot of people that need and want God, but the workers are few. And I'm sure his guys were like, yeah, we need workers. Well, then you read on. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. <laughs> it's like... He's like, guys, the harvest, pray for workers. They're like, yeah, pray for workers. And he's like, you're the workers. <laughs> you can pray, but you're the workers. And he sends them out. And they're like, oh, it's us? Oh, okay. And they go out and he sends them out. But he's not done. 
Because then a little further down the road, as they're out there sharing their faith, there's more disciples. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others. And he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. He told them the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Again, there it is. It's the same thing. Therefore, pray to the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Same thing. Guess what? Now go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. See, it's the 72. You're the ones. You need to go out and do it. You need to go out and be fishers of men. You need to make disciples. You need to continue growing this thing. So he starts with the call. He continues bringing other people in. He's calling all of them to go out and be fishers of men, which we're supposed to imitate. But it was because he had compassion on them. And, you know, in this world, there's a lot of people that don't have much empathy for whatever reason. Can't feel. It's one of the things that lacks in our world so much is empathy. And it's why we can't relate to other people and we have walls between us and we get selfish where Jesus had such empathy and such compassion. You know, I just want to put this picture up because I just remember when I was young and we used to get the milk cartons and on every milk carton, they had a a different missing child and they would get the picture of them when they were young and, and maybe a drawing of what they might look like now. And it was just a call to help, a call to help find the children. And it just, man, it broke my heart every time. And, and guys, there's just hundreds of thousands of children that go missing. And can you imagine if your child went missing or someone you love went missing and you went to your friends and said, I need your help. I need you to help me find my loved one. And that person said, I don't know. People might think I'm weird. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not comfortable with talking to people. I'm shy, so I can't do it. How would that make you feel? It's the, your loved one. And they make excuses for not helping. How do you think God feels when he says, I just gave you the greatest gift of salvation you could ever want. You're saved. All I'm asking you to do is go out and find others. Find the rest of my children. How do you think he feels when we make excuses? Oh, I'm shy. Well, by the way, shy, it's sinful. The Bible says God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. So if God didn't give it to you, who gave it to you? Think on that. And we make excuses. We don't want to look weird, blah, blah, blah. Could you imagine if someone made that excuse to not help find your loved one? Would it not break your heart? I mean, imagine that. The next time you know you should share your faith with that checkout person or you know you should share your faith with this other person and you and you wimp out. Think about that, because that's what God wants us to have. He wants us to have compassion. He's asking for our help. How can we accept the gift of his son's death on the cross for us and then not pay it forward? This is what God wants. And and the thing is, it's so awesome because you literally get a purpose a reason to wake up every morning. You might hate the physical job you do. You might face injustice at work. You might have relationship problems. But you get to help the creator of the universe change eternal destinies. Let's go. Man, that's fired up. You know, I want to challenge you to read a book. It's called The Master Plan of Evangelism. I remember I read this as a brand new Christian. And it's amazing. And it just talks about the master plan. And how when Jesus came to the earth, everything he did was to build the mission, to help more people know about him, to train the ones he was with, to go out and do that after he was gone, and then for them to train other people to do it. It's an amazing read. It's a short read, but it's so inspiring. When you look at it, you're like, wow, I just, I don't think about that. Everything he did was for that. You know, helping people with physical needs is great. And there's a lot of people who love to help the poor and do that. And you know what? We need to. But there's a lot of Christians that will do that and not share their faith. You know what that is? When you just help them physically and not spiritually, all you're doing is fattening them up for the kill. I'm sorry to say it that way. But if we're just going to deal with physical needs and not spiritual, that's really what's happening. We need to do both. And our purpose is to help people get to heaven. we got to spring into action. We are the army of God, right? 
I mean, it's, it's what we're all about. Everything we do should be about purpose. You know, I, I, I had to stop playing football because I broke my shoulder last year. Most of you guys know that was my favorite ministry. A bunch of you guys are here because you were met in that ministry. Um, but so I had to figure out something else to do. Tracy's like, you should go back to playing music. I'm like, yeah, okay. So we got the 5D band going, some of the, some of the people here in the church. And our whole mission is to get into the community and show a difference. And show that you can rock out and have fun and be pure about it. And it's been great because everybody notices the difference in our band. It's like we just, everybody's like last night I was out and friends were saying, man, it's just a joy on your faces. It's like infectious. And it's just like, man, it's like it's something different about you guys. And, and God is just opening up doors. We're playing this afternoon at the, we got invited to play in the single most biggest Cinco de Mayo festival in Western New York, downtown. They had 8,000 people there last year. And we get to play it today. And I'm just, I feel so honored that God is giving us a platform to be able to reach people and make a difference. We've only been together 10 months. And come on, God is moving, right? Because everything we do is about reaching people. That's why we do all that we do. So you see, call, his first call, his next call, he's building his whole time so we could all spring into action. And I want to now look at his last words. You know, when people's last words, it carries a lot of weight, right? Because they know they're going to be gone and, and they want to tell you they love you or they want to give you something important. It's their last words. We get to see Jesus' last words. He died on the cross. He's resurrected. He gets with his guys for, for 40 days to teach them and get them ready to go forward. And these are literally the last words before he's taken up to heaven before them. This is what he says. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I always thought this was odd. He was resurrected, standing right before him, but they doubted. And I think, what were they doubting? I mean, he was there. But it's interesting because the Greek word for doubt is distazo, and it means to be of two minds or confused. So I really believe they were more like, this is great, but what does it mean? And that's when he tells them. He goes on and says, Jesus came near them and said, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he tells them, you need to go. You need to baptize all nations. It's not a racist church, amen? All nations should be able to go to heaven. All nations should worship together. And he gives us this purpose to go out and do that. To go and baptize people and, and make disciples of them. Disciple is just a, a Greek word for follower. So, but that's what it tells them to do. And right now you're thinking, yeah, that, yeah, they should. They were the apostles. Oh, but yet there's more. He's like, you need to go out and make these disciples, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Oh, so wait. It doesn't stop with the apostles. It's a multiplying ministry. He's like, you need to go and make disciples and teach them to do the same things I taught you. Oh, he taught them to be a fisher of men. He said, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. You're the workers. So all the way down 2,000 years later to you and I, same call. Same thing, same purpose, same reason to live. That's what he gave us right here. Jesus says, go. This is God's plan for the world. There's no plan B. If we don't do it, it doesn't get done. He didn't say, yeah, and if you're too selfish to do it, I'm just going to rain down little pamphlets from heaven on everybody. No. He didn't say, oh, if, it does, if you guys aren't willing to do it, I'll just come back myself. No. One plan right here. Disciples that make disciples that make disciples. Now, you've got to be made a disciple before you even know how to go what and teach other people to be. So it starts with us doing our best to get ourselves right with God, biblically, and then we can go out and share with people. And he says, I will be with you always. You're not alone. You're walking with God. When you're in that line, you're afraid to share with that person because you're worried about the person behind you. The person behind you is Jesus. He's right there with you saying, you got this. You know, you look behind, oh, the Lord's with me? Yeah, I'm ready, let's go. That's what it's about. It's having purpose and making a difference. Could you, could you imagine? Another scenario here. Imagine, you know, my driveway is filled with snow. Nothing we can relate to in Buffalo. 
you can't get out of your door. You can't get out of your garage. You got to get to work. And you're like, ah, my shovel's broke. I need a shovel. And, and you call up your friend Steve and say, Steve, can you bring me a shovel? Can you help me out? Can I borrow your shovel? And, and he brings me this. <laughs> Is this some kind of new invisible blade? No, it's, it's a shovel without a blade. Now, if your friend brought you this, what would you feel at that moment? You wouldn't be real happy about it. Why? Because this cannot serve the purpose it was supposed to be created to do. It's useless. And someone gives this to you and says, hey, here it is. This is your answer. No answer. It means nothing. So, Steve, thank you, but I'll turn it down. Try to get a real shovel. Or, man, you ever get a pen go dry on you? And you say, hey, can I borrow your pen? Yeah, here it is. And it's dry too? Are you psyched about that pen? <laughs> right, this pen is awesome. No, you know what you do with that pen? It's useless. Doesn't do what it was created to do. What about us? A Christian who lives without sharing their faith. And I don't mean once a month, once in every blue moon. I mean it's your purpose. It's what is most on your heart. It's what you spend your time doing. I love sharing my faith every day, everywhere I go. That's why I live. I love it. Not everybody responds great, but some people do. And some of you guys are here today because of that. Amen. Guys, that's what we we're created to do, to live with a purpose. You can't call yourself a Christian and make excuses for why you don't share your faith. Your whole purpose in life is to make disciples. If we're not about that, how does God feel? And the truth is, it's a command. It's really not an option. People say, oh, it's not my gift. You know, that is a convenient excuse to get out of anything you don't want to do. It's not my gift. Yeah, there are people that are gifted at certain things. But if God said, you have to share your faith today with somebody or you're going to hell, oh, all of a sudden you'd have the gift. All of a sudden, man, you'd, you'd have the gift, right? Oh, I, yeah, I got the gift. I got it today. Well, if you got it today, you can have it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Come on, guys. You know you can do it. You know we can make a difference in the world. You know we've got to make a difference in the world. Our room is diverse for a reason. Because our church reaches out to all people at all times, all opportunities, so we can help get each other to heaven and make a difference in the world around us. What are you living for today? And what will it mean in 100 years? Physical stuff means nothing. All that matters is where we stand with God and did we make a difference doing it. Amen. His first call was a call to action. His next call was a call to action. All he did the whole time was teach them to a call to action. And his very last words, he could have said anything. He said, go and make disciples. Spring into action. At the end of your life, and a lot of times you see people's gravestones, and it has their, their birth date, and then the dash, and their death date. The only question we need to ask ourselves at the end of life is, what did I do with my dash? What did I do with my dash? You know, when I get to heaven, I want there to be a tree of life that came from me sharing my faith. You know, I remember when we were in Philadelphia, we were baptizing people, sharing our faith abundantly. And then we came to Buffalo and we were here for you for years. And this kid shows up at church service and he's like, hey, Danny. I'm like, yeah. Acting like he knew me. I'm like, what's up? He's like, hey, I'm Dan Akram. I'm like, oh yeah, what's up? He goes, you're my great grandfather in the faith. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, because you shared your faith with this guy and he shared his faith with this guy and that guy shared his faith with me. So if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. I'm your great grandson in the faith. And you know, all those other people are sharing with other people and building a tree of life. And I am going to feel so honored before God if I can get to heaven and I have built a tree of life to come with me. Tell me what's better than that. A home, a car, looks, popularity, what's better than that? And that's all that matters. And even if you just, you just, you might share your faith with a thousand people and no one responds. You did your part. We're called to plant and water. Spread the seed, water it with love, show people love in Jesus. It's on them to make the decision. But our job is to plant and water. What 
did you do with your dash? As we take communion, I want us to understand that that was the way God showed compassion for us by allowing Jesus to die on the cross. And, and he, he allowed his son to be tortured, beaten, and killed for you and for me. It's personal because he loves us that much. And all he asks from us is to pay that forward. Today, as we remember that sacrifice, and as you reflect on your life as a Christian, I ask you to challenge yourself to spring into action. Amen. Next week, make a goal to have a friend here at church. Make it next week our goal to have to put out extra chairs. Because that's what it's about. Amen. Getting the word out. It's why Jesus came and it's what we need to imitate. So let's reflect on that as we look at the sacrifice of Jesus and let it inspire us to pay it forward. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this time, grateful that we get to be a part in this amazing endeavor, that we are allowed to play a part, that, that we mere mortals are allowed to be ambassadors for the creator of the universe. That is mind-blowing, and it is, it is so fulfilling. It's more fulfilling than anything else in life, anything else here, and I pray it would just, just power us into our purpose that we can spring into action today. We love you, God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today for service. I am so excited for the year 2024. It's gonna be a great year, not only to grow closer to God, but to grow closer to one another and to get deeper in the word. We have so many amazing things coming down the pipeline here at Vessel Church, from great sermon series to cool Bible studies and everything in between. So please make sure that if you're in the Buffalo area and even if you're not, Stay connected with all of our social media and our website so that you can know everything that we've got going on. We love you. We hope you have a great year ahead. Take it easy and have a great day.